cover in, in the presentation is uh, some of the science-based response um, to the Cat River spill. And also, uh, toward the end, talk a little bit more about uh, transportation and um, some of the follow-up work uh, that's been done since the spill happened. To uh, acknowledge my uh, uh, colleagues that assist with the project, it was Renzel, Chris Holt, uh, David Sung, and Isabel Cazzarelli. Go here. Okay. A uh, little bit on the locational background of the the spill. Um, spill happened in and in July of 2010. So summer uh, it was during a rainstorm along the Lakehead system and uh, Line 6B part Lakehead system. 43,000 gallons of diluted bitumen. This is was diluted with um, natural condensate, our sands oil. Uh, the release happened over 17 hours, and it was uh, charged into a wetland uh, that was adjacent to a creek uh, in the Kalamazoo River. And the spill is about 38 miles of the river. And this happened in kind of the middle of Michigan, and, and it was about miles upstream of, of Lake Michigan. The spill caught in the uh, um, photo there, you can see a photo of the, the rupture um, along the pipeline and the, one of the side seams. Diluted bitumen, um, in this case, uh, it was mainly a cold lake blend was, was the type. I can see this diagram here that has gravity and dy dynamic viscosity. That cold lake and diluted bitumen in, in general is much different than uh, any of the uh, um, kind of conventional crude oils that are, are transported in pipelines. Um, it's uh, very dense. Um, if the density is close to there, uh, but it, it is um, uh, it's float, um, and it has a very high viscosity. Um, and very uh, sticky. It has a high adherence uh, to sediment uh, and organic matter. You can see that in the, the photo lower left there. This, shows the Bakken crude oil and how it's uh, different, too, than um, other conventional oils. It's kind of on the other end of the spectrum, which having light density, um, high gravity, and then um, very low uh, viscosity. We were doing, dealing with a new substance um, with the diluted bitumen. Um, a major um, significance of the spill, uh, it was uh, Wetland oils, just in general, um, at first of its large um, of diluted bitumen. Uh, this has been um, upwards of 1.2 uh, million by the time of the cleanup, so very expensive. And initiated um, two USDOT studies on bilbit transport and pipeline. Um, these are National Academy of Sciences reports. And uh, these are just a couple of um, uh, summaries that were in the making after uh, this, re this spill happened. And you can see, I don't know if you can see my um, mouse here. Um, it, this shows uh, that the Kelmas River had quite a bit of wetlands um, in the floodplain areas. And then in the lower, the, the main um, species um, were turtles. There was, uh, Several thousand turtles in the river that were affected by the spill. Um, during the rainstorm, it was about uh, a, a flood, a um, recurrent interval of about 20 years, um, so it did affect the the wetlands and the and the floodplain. So, but uh, on the timeline on the response and the recovery, um, if the uh, response was a unified command. EPA, Michigan DEQ, and, and Enbridge. Um, it was successful at cleaning up the floating oil, um, 843,000 gallons. Uh, about 766,000 gallons were recovered within that first month uh, using conventional oil recovery methods. 400,000 gallons were recovered uh, from soil um, vegetation and debris. 
um, left approximately 80,000 gallons um, sank and were mixed with the river sediment. And this happened um, within about two weeks uh, of the spill. And you can see the timeline down at the bottom and um, how the floating oil recovery lasted about a month. But that um, recovery for the submerged oil lasted you know, more than four years. And so that's where the, the time and the expense came in uh, for the recovery. Um, a couple of photos kind of showing the upper left shows the location of the pipeline. This is um, during the, um, the pipeline af after the, the break. Um, the photo on the upper right shows the still uh, positively in oil. Um, after the spill, you can see the dark um, colors within the water. What was uh, very odd was that by about day 10, during the cleanup, again, just um, uh, oil had been cleaned up, um, and there uh, wasn't much seen in the river you know, during overflights and such, except that when the uh, sediment was disturbed, um, then we'd see a green, um, rise up from the bottom. As shown on the lower right. And so, of this, even by 2012, 2000, or two, two years after this, this spill, you can still see the sheen coming up. And then on the upper left, you can maybe see a little bit of what the oil would look like um, visible oil. You can still see mixed with the fine grain cement. So, this is in positional areas of the, the river. And there's also um, some tar flakes and uh, globs, uh, as you can see here. If we look at it under UV epifluorescence, uh, UV, UV epifluorescence, you can see kind of aggregates of, of sediment particles in the, in the yellow and the sediment particles in the brown. Um, and these are um, identified by um, Dr. Ken Lee was at the time with uh, the Canada Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, then studies in spills and uh, readily recognized them in the Kalamazoo River. And showing the extent of the high oiling in the river still two years after the spill. And this uh, represents the, the spills mile spill zone. You see the dots and the orange dots uh, represent the areas of, of heavy and moderate oil. So it was quite uh, still extensive um, across those 38 miles. And you see the concentrated in the three impoundment, pounded sections of the river, um, the Sesco impoundment, the Battle Creek mill ponds, and down in the delta area of uh, Morrow Lake. And then um, throughout the rest of the day, it was kind of spotty, depending on where those depositional zones were located. Uh, uh, show a, um, a very simple diagram of the command system and how the submerged oil was, was worked to that. Again, this was kind of a new thing. Um, you can see that within the um, incident system, submerged oil were both in the operations uh, and the planning and through environmental planning. Um, one of the things that w was done for this, um, um, especially given the length of it, in 2012, um, a support coordination group uh, was formed. Uh, this had about 25 um, experts uh, from uh, universities, um, agencies, um, the uh, consultants, and then also um, those that were um, more local and had a familiarity uh, with the project, as um, represents from uh, directly from operations. And uh, the three areas that we're especially looking at were the addition and quantification and fate and transport of the um, submerged oil, uh, what the ecological effects were, and then recovery and containment. Three scientific support coordinators, and I was uh, one of the one of three, 
Uh, and we then were able to use the information gathered from the experts in the scientific support coordination group and pass information to the EPA federal on-scene coordinator. And then he, he or she would use this information um, to um, feed the determination of, of cleanup endpoints. Areas and this uh, scientific support coordination group is very closely linked um, with operations as well. So, and during the, the four years of the cleanup, um, we developed a multiple line of evidence approach, and it really involved six different aspects from geomorphic mapping, uh, polling elements, systematic tracking and mapping of sheen, uh, forensic chemistry. We did some um, hydrodynamic and sediment transport modeling, and then a net environmental benefit analysis. I'll just run through um, each of these, um, just give an overview of those. Um, first, geomorphic mapping. This became the basis for all of the response and the assessment activities, and it was first um, developed by uh, Tetra Tech, who is a consultant to Enbridge. It, it techniques that they used in the uh, for contaminated sediment uh, cleanups, but then um, doing a playing um, to see if they would have any uh, sheen uh, to rise to the surface in depositional areas. So they applied this technique and developed it further um, for the submerged oil characteristics that they had um, with the zoo spill. So in the bottom right there, you can see um, the categorical um, uh, framework uh, that was used based on the percent coverage and the and the number of globules, um, and um, basically three oils of um, three categories of oiling, uh, basically. Uh, one really important thing with this too was that all of these polling points were um, geo referenced and uh, daily loaded into the. Um, Response um, geographic information system. So just a number of points are generated uh, very quickly, and can be an example of what that polling looks like. And you can kind of get a feel for the um, the um, the and the and um, the and what the the sediment looks like. So it's kind of that silty, very organic, rich uh, sediment. Um, a quick glimpse at the geomorphic mapping. It involved um, over 1,200 polygons and the average in size by about five acres. Um, for um, recovery of submerged oil, um, because of the, the oil being concentrated in depositional zones of the and one of the techniques uh, that was used, it was developed um, especially for submerged oil uh, in two. 11 was an agitation toolbox uh, technique, and this was in um, targeted in uh, the deposition settings. Um, examples of, of basically physical, mechanical means for agitating sediment, either by hand or machine uh, rakes. Um, as the sediment was, it was agitated, um, there'd be surface contained, and then also um, sweep boat following with. Um, Absorbent uh, materials to pick up the the uh, oil and, and the sheen. It's very uh, extensive. They've done uh, all those depositional areas up and down the 38 miles of river. Here's a what the polling results look like from the spring 2011 to the fall 2011. So this is after much vegetation uh, work was done. And so the two maps show the percent of uh, the polling points every quarter mile along that 38 eight miles. And you can see basically the reduction in the reds and the, and the orange from spring to fall with um, the upstream um, site at two miles and then the downstream at um, Morrow Lake um, down at the 38, 39 uh, river mile. Of how to look at the poll data. This was done um, twice a year, then in the spring and the in the fall. Um, and this is for our impoundment at Soresco, starting in the spring 2011, and then fall 
2011, um, after that vegetation work was done, some some areas had had, had um, oil and, and others kind of gained more, as you can see in this middle section here. So it was used over time to show um, where the oil um, was possibly migrating and then also uh, where it was accumulating. Um, so this is in spring 2013. You can kind of see um, some oil kind of building up at, at one of the, the fans here. So in 2012, um, there's still uh, quite a bit of sheen happening, and so that uh, generated the, the need for a systematic uh, tracking and mapping of sheen, and so that was done through 2014, up and down, and whenever sheen was and then the um, sweeper boats come out and uh, pick that up. And in, in combination with where we would get the moderate and heavy um, oiling from the polling results, and show the areas the target that could be targeted um, for cleanup, and also where the kind of the, the, the problematic areas are. And this is the the delta um, down at the the bottom of the spill zone at Morrow Lake. Um, chemistry was another thing that was developed, and this is typically um, for oil spills and large ones especially that last a long time, uh, uh, something that's uh, needed um, to, to get the, the fingerprint and to be able to distinguish that from other hydrocarbons and, and um, sources of, of uh, petroleum products that might be in sediment. This is a display. Uh, several biomarker compounds um, for the line 60 oil. And what it shows is we had uh, uh, high um, concentrations of four triaromatic steroids. This is kind of unique uh, to the line 60 um, oil. And then HOPE is another biomarker that um, was used as a conservative uh, biomarker. Um, um, was uh, seen in HOPE with it in similar concentrations in the sediment that was collected upstream of the spill zone, um, where you can see that the reference sediment was uh, low in uh, aromatic steroids. And then it also had these reference interference compounds that were associated with peat. Again, we had both natural and um, human-related um, hydrocarbons that um, were in the uh, um, sediment uh, in the river. The uh, reference sediment was uh, depleted in the uh, triaromatic steroids um, relative to the hopane concentrations. Formed a basis then, if you look at sediment, um, oiled sediment is shown here on the on the left. You can kind of see under UV light some of the oil um, standing out uh, in a sediment core. Um, it is a, is a uh, graph showing the biomarkers for the sediment and kind of over the fingerprint um, from line 6B, you can again see the um, decrease in the um, uh, triaromatic steroids in there relative to what would be expected um, in the um, reference. What was um, as a, um, um, and a, and a to make sure that uh, getting was indeed line 6B oil is that and when the sediment could be agitated, and then the sheen and the oil globs collected from the surface, and that's what's in the upper left here. And um, the sample could be analyzed and then would get um, the exact uh, biomarker fingerprint um, from the line 6B oil. So these rates are used to, to distinguish. Um, and basically calculate the concentration of line 6B oil in uh, sediment samples. And then this was used to quantify the remaining <coughs> amount of oil um, in, the, in the, the river sediment. Uh, what lines of evidence that was used to uh, was to simulate the fate and transport of, uh, of the oil, both to be we basically to simulate what we were seeing in the polling data, 
but also um, to simulate if there was a chance for larger events to happen in the river, you know, what, what might happen to the different deposits uh, of oil sediment. I started out simple using hydrodynamic modeling and then went to more complex with uh, sediment transport model and then a new um, oil particle aggregate uh, transport algorithm was added um, to the sediment transport model. And in the process of doing that too, we also looked at um, how oil droplets uh, specific to the dilbit, how they were formed and uh, reacted with um, form the oil particle aggregates. So this was kind of on a day to maybe some um, complex models um, that are being developed in the future that would look at how this uh, oil particle aggregates or OPA, how they behave, and then what um, how they both form and then also break up um, over time. For the Mizzou uh, River oil spill, we had uh, models that were worked with at different um, spatial scales, we had a 2D hydrodynamic model that, that extended uh, for the 30 miles, and a 3D hydrodynamic model um, that the University of Illinois um, did for the um, uh, lake and its delta. And then we also had um, a, um, uh, a third that looked at um, these depositional areas that enhanced sediment uh, traps that had um, small uh, grid that could look at some of the um, depths of sediment movement through those areas. And then the, um, the new thing that was done uh, for this, uh, this response was um, uh, developing that oil uh, mineral aggregate or oil particle aggregate transport algorithm that could be um, linked into the sediment transport algorithm. Uh, some work that was done again to kind of look at how these uh, aggregate forms, these are done by the University of Illinois, their Ben hydraulics uh, lab, uh, some Ben tests uh, using some conventional mixing tests that are uh, typically done for marine environments and coastal um, areas. Uh, where we get these um, uh, spherical particles these are generally in the 10 to 100 micron size, uh, just less than 10 uh, microns. Once those would settle and get left to settle, then they'd form these more complex aggregates that um, the, the sizes would be uh, much larger for, for those aggregates. Now I also um, ran uh, their uh, annular flume to look at of the particles. And then um, they ran um, some tests with their settling column um, to look at settling velocity of these uh, uh, different types of particles. And here are some of the um, type that's called a, the more solid type of oil particle uh, aggregate. They're a little bit uh, larger. Um, these uh, results were then fed into the at transport algorithm that was part of Sedzel J. This was what was done in combination um, with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Peter, um, and then uh, Limnotech uh, out of Ann Arbor. So they basically took these different characteristics in the oil concentrations into the lake. That's part of the Sedzel J model. The last uh, line of evidence that was used, and this was, this was in 2012 and then used to basically determine the, the final recovery that was done uh, for the base, was called environmental benefit analyses. And this looked at basically the um, risks of leaving uh, oil in place uh, against the risk of removing it. So basically, left in place. Um, What's the toxicity associated with that? It's the smelling, um, loss of habitat, um, remaining parts with sheen, um, and um, at you know the in the other end of the scale, um, what's the risk of removal, such as um, the 
associated with that physical removal, such as loss of habitat, or physical trauma, uh, increased tree and erosion, and those sorts of things. So here's a couple. So we had these uh, about over 200, um, and still in 2013, about 200 uh, targets along the river. And here's an example of some from the um, uh, Bat Creek. Uh, and so this is another impoundment. And for each area, then um, the net environmental benefits analysis uh, was, was um, again, this is with a, a group of, a subgroup of experts from the scientific support coordination uh, group. Um, uh, some of the determinations ranged from um, that there was no oil anymore in some of the targeted tactical areas. Um, some of them were to evaluate for possible recovery. Um, other just continued um, sheen collection and monitoring for natural attenuation. And then um, somewhat rare, but shown in the kind of the light yellow there, they maybe had visible oil, um, but there was no recovery um, recommended because these contained high quality uh, vegetation. Um, by um, any of the, the physical um, such. So these are overlaid you know, with the repeated results. Um, and then um, the team would go back to see how um, recommendations should change. And basically, on the, the lasting of the amount of, of oil and um, oiling. End of uh, EPA's involvement. Then um, the last of the the recovery that was done was to to dress um, areas in three impoundments and then uh, five um, of the, there was probably I think like 17 uh, sediment traps. So five of the 17 um, sediment traps result 250 acres of of area uh, dredged um, up through um, 2014. In the fall of 2014, EPA uh, transferred the response to Michigan DEQ. Enbridge had continued uh, polling through um, 2016. And then other things that are kind of continuing on, there are remedial investigations that include the groundwater monitoring, um, continued work with uh, the river restoration, uh, the Resco Dam uh, was removed as part of the response um, and, the, and the cleanup of sediment in the impoundment upstream um, and uh, various aspects um, related to that. Um, in 2015, uh, the state of Michigan uh, settled with, with Enbridge. Um, some direct um, implications that came out of the Kalamazoo River spill. Um, Late to the um, environmental setting of the Kalamazoo River, which is, is very typical for large rivers in the Midwest. Um, uh, some things are that basically a portion of, of build it will likely submerge, and this is probably of 10 to 20 percent of the, the total build. Um, the oil particle aggregates they readily formed in this environment um, with the Versetta. Even the Kalamazoo River had relatively low suspended sediment concentrations, and it was mainly uh, organic-rich uh, silt. The merge of an oil sediment, um, the sediment and recovery uh, is, is, is needed um, and needs to be planned type of spills. Um, there's, uh, Length of the cleanup, um, the submerged oil, and oil sediment uh, did episodically migrate downstream during floods. So that's another thing um, that's an implication for future for, for future spills. Um, two is that ice um, and the cold it can complicate response operations, and um, since mixing with sediment that the um, the clean points need to consider um, having that submerged oil um, component 
uh, to the cleanup endpoints. Uh, so the response um, of uh, putting together a few reports. Um, this one contains um, some of the data that the GS collected and it's a list of some of the um, data that were needed um, for the submerged oil uh, part spill. Uh, most of the uh, data were collected by uh, Enbridge contractors, but here's the listing from stream flow to geomorphology. Uh, you can see there are uh, sediment related, um, suspended sediment concentrations and loads. Um, but, uh, there was uh, hundreds of uh, cores um, that were collected um, to get physical and chemical properties of those. Section surveys, um, sediment county, the fingerprints, and then um, the also all of interest was the um, oiled sediment uh, toxicity. I didn't have any time to talk about that today. We we did a little bit on the acute end, but there were basically there was um, a much need uh, for uh, looking at chronic uh, toxicity, and then um, what biodegradation properties. Uh, still is definitely needed on that. Um, some of the future science needs too. We put together a report in 2015 to um, look at a review of the science um, and of oil particle interactions um, for both marine and fire environments. Um, and so we have a short list of some of those uh, science needs, ranging from experiments of the suspension breakup of OPAs, uh, simulation of the uh, fate and transport of submerged oil, um, with uh, cold climate uh, and ice implications um, for uh, the response. And then best to monitor and assess, uh, assess post spill um, that submerged um, uh, component to much different than what we do for. Uh, or column or uh, for floating oil. Um, effects are on the benthic organisms, um, the vulnerability to critical habitats, um, points, um, um, specific response and containment techniques for um, submerged oil. Um, then um, some uh, addition of, of basically of of getting all oil uh, contained and cleaned up um, before it submerges, basically. At that point, it becomes um, such, uh, you know, exponentially hard uh, to clean up. And then um, uh, marine and uh, Canadian side of things, the um, oil particle interactions goes, there's been studies done on its use um, means for uh, dispersant. Um, for the best, um, EPA uh, inland waters, um, there's the use of, of dispersants, physical uh, or chemical allowed. Um, the thing that has kind of been identified through a lot of these studies is the um, importance of having um, environmental sensitivity um, mapped um, of different coastal areas. and the map for the Great Lakes. Um, uh, this was done in the 1990s, um, and the indexes that were used to define the environmental sensitivity were based on physical, biological, and, and human uh, indicators. Um, so there's some interest in, in updating uh, this since it's been about 20 years since it's been done. I think that exists uh, similar to this uh, yet for the uh, inland waters and rivers. Uh, reports, so I just kind of have a few reports here that I'll, I'll run through that have come out um, in the last year. There's been quite a bit published, uh, quite a few stuff on uh, done by uh, Cornell University and just had something out of um, some interesting statistics on um, the uh, production of both um, Sands or the bitumen and the Bakken shale. You can see that 
that uh, the, over the last uh, 10 years, um, the production of oil sands has doubled and um, just the kind of exponential growth in um, the, you know, the Bakken and shale oils. Um, this particular report um, runs through um, and analyzes um, areas um, of uh, a high risk. There you can see on the, the cover photo. And they looked at both the uh, well truck uh, shipping and pipelines. Uh, interesting um, statistics that they are just the amount of miles of pipeline in Canada in the U.S. with with um, a large amount of those 9,000 miles uh, in the Great Lakes region, and then 55 percent of the pipelines um, in the U.S. Great Lakes region are uh, greater than 40 years old. One of the most common causes for spills is um, a failure in, in the, the pipeline infrastructure. Um, so that's um, uh, an issue, um, especially in the Great Lakes with the, the aging pipeline system. <clears throat> Here's a map um, that, that shows uh, quite a bit. Um, it's a nice uh, summary. Um, the existing lines and uh, planned expansions and, and new lines and pipelines across the, the U.S. and Canada. Uh, one of the uh, interesting things that, that stands out is um, the uh, concentration of the pipelines through, through the center of the U.S. And then also um, with the expansions, there's quite a bit going on um, for the uh, Direction. So this is a, a major change in in the direction of the transportation of of crude. Um, you know, 20 years ago, it would be coming into the U.S. Um, where it's it's um, being uh, out from the center of, of the continent uh, towards the coast, basically. Uh, some of the uh, expansions that are proposed, uh, the Enbridge Gateway to the West Coast, the Trans Canada Energy East Line um, to the East Coast, and then um, I'm here in Wisconsin, so a few of them that are closer to home um, are Line Five um, has been the um, somewhat because of the um, the uh, at um, Mackinac Straits and, and some worries there about uh, pipeline uh, in that area. Um, plan for um, <clears throat> Minnesota and Wisconsin involved the uh, line three and 67. Line 61, um, line three is also called the Sandpiper line. You heard that in the news. Um, both an expansion and a, a relocation of pipelines. Um, and then 61-2 um, is along the same corridor, um, but the, the, you can see there's um, a large uh, expansion amount of, of oil that the pipeline, pipeline can eventually carry from 100,000 to 1.2. Million, and so I think the line 61 is, is going to be expanded to uh, to two two lines uh, along the corridor. The results from the National Academy of Sciences. I'll just kind of run through these really quick, but I want to show you the uh, results from this study. Um, this one was looking at the um, the transport of diluted bitumen um, relative to other more conventional oils that would be carried in, in pipelines. And so they do um, for transport um, effects and response what um, for the different properties, how they differ. And then they distinguish between the diluted bitumen that would still um, be in that floating stage with the, with the um, uh, some uh, volatile organic compounds that would uh, be of issue, um, but should be different than the weathered dilute bitumen that would likely be mixed with sediment. So you can see something like um, the depth would be similar for diluted bitumen, but 
um, for the weathered um, bitumen. Um, like the toxicity from those uh, benzene um, compounds, the BTEC, um, diluted bitumen, and weathered bitumen would have uh, less uh, issue, less concern. The, the, the fate uh, then, um, things you know are less, others are, are more, are the same, um, like the uh, flammability, um, it's the uh, potential for um, fire explosion, it would be similar to diluted bitumen, um, but less uh, for the weather. So, um, um, something like uh, the Water quality from oil in the water column and sheening is going to be the same for diluted bitumen, um, more um, for the weather, uh, that sort of thing. And you can see toxicity, part of things is uh, relatively unknown in, in a state. Um, lastly, then, um, too, um, again, there's the, like I said, there's quite a bit of studies that have been coming out. This one's from Canada and was. Uh, more inclusive of, of all types of crude oil um, released into uh, the aqueous environment. So again, it's looking, and this is coming out of Royal Society Canada, um, and a lot of the um, panel that authored this report, uh, a, few, a few of them were uh, part of the scientific support coordination group. Um, high priority research needs that they had listed um, and as data gaps, basically. Um, they basically need more data from high risk areas, um, database for risk assessment information. Um, these are all things that are needed. Um, shoreline sensitivity mapping uh, in the Arctic. Again, you can see by the distribution of those pipelines, um, more. Cold regions um, are are going to be uh, a priority, and being clean up that that would work under Arctic uh, conditions are important. Um, the other thing is to take advantage of spills of opportunity uh, and to, to look at, um, study the fate and behavior and effects of of those spills. I think I'll, I think I still have time for questions. 